Professor Helen, thank you for being here. Not just professor, but also parent. Parent of yes. a <laughs> I'm very CMC-er. proud of that. Uh, so thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Turn it over to you. All right. So I'm going to share my screen um, just while everyone's getting logged in. Um, so uh, let me see. Hopefully you can all uh, now see uh, my uh, screen. It should say GameStop, uh, uh, Econ 50 and GameStop. Um, hopefully someone's nodding. Uh, okay, yes. uh, good, thank you. So let me just start this off a couple of slides and I'll talk you through the game and then we'll sort of play this. Um, so here's the basic, uh, here's the basic story. Um, I used to, I've been teaching uh, Econ 50 at CMC since 1998. Uh, in fact, the daughter who just graduated from CMC was actually uh, born right before I drove and taught my first Econ 50 uh, session at CMC. So um, it's been a while that I've been doing this. Um, and it's always been a kind of a lecture class, lecture, um, some discussion. And what happened, uh, and Jeff and I were talking about this uh, sort of earlier was, I just decided that wasn't going to work particularly well uh, sort of as a Zoom class. And so I set about modifying this for last semester. And there were sort of three things I, I did. One was I pre-recorded the lecture. And then I took the class time and kind of divided it between three things. One was solving models. Um, so we would divide into small groups and work on um, some basic economic models. We did some tutorials. So we had discussions on things like universal basic income and prediction markets. And then what I'm going to have you do today, we did experiments, uh, which is uh, that we basically uh, went through and uh, uh, basically did uh, experiments that mirrored what we were sort of learning in class. So just to give you a sense of how this works, this is one of my favorite articles uh, in all of Econ 50. It's an article called uh, The Use of Knowledge in Society. Uh, and it's by uh, Friedrich Hayek, who's the guy on the left there. And back in 45, Hayek gave a really uh, uh, brilliant exposition of kind of what markets do. And he basically said, look, um, Jeff and I have private information. If we want to have a spontaneous order wherein Jeff and I sort of engage in trades, Jeff, you just happen to be right below me in the Zoom, so you're going to be my student du jour. Um, so Jeff and I basically uh, want to engage in trades. Jeff has oranges to sell. I want to buy oranges, but he, I don't know how much it costs him to produce. He doesn't know how valuable I have these oranges. And so we need some system to coordinate our private information. And Hayek said that system is the market economy. It's the price system. And a friend of mine, uh, Alex Tabrock at George Mason had this great quote, which is a price is a signal wrapped in an incentive. Um, so that basically if the price of oranges goes up, Jeff wants to supply more oranges. I wanna buy fewer oranges and that's supply and demand, which raises a really interesting question. How do you demonstrate this in a classroom? And the answer is usually I would just draw supply and demand on the board. Uh, we're off to the races. And, and the question would be, could you sort of do better, right? And that brings us to this guy. Oh, sorry. Um, this guy is Vernon Smith. Uh, and in the early 60s, Vernon Smith was a professor at the University of Arizona. He was facing the problem I just described. How do you explain markets to students? And in particular, one thought was to get data. Econ's an empirical uh, uh, um, discipline, but it's really hard to satisfy what we love to call the ceteris paribus assumption, that everything else is equal. A lot of data on like gas prices and consumption, other things are gonna be changing. So that's not gonna work, uh, that's not going to work so great. So Smith got this idea in this big lecture at, at University of Arizona in the early 60s, that he was gonna just run an experiment. He was gonna give people different valuations, whether they were on the supply and demand side, and he was gonna run an experiment. And lo and behold, it worked. He got an equilibrium, the students thought this was great. And in many ways, uh, Smith was off to the races. He won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for really inventing a whole field of experimental economics because he had a methodology for testing our models where you can really literally hold things constant. And so in reality, Econ 50 day one is going over the syllabus. Econ 50 day two is actually playing a supply and demand game. The problem with supply and demand games is they involve oranges and they are not that exciting. So I didn't figure like I could actually lure you all to a class that said, Econ 50 day two, we're gonna sell oranges. Uh, and I decided to do a little bit of a switch, which was we're gonna do Econ 50 day 20 GameStop because I figured that would get people uh, to sort of show up uh, to a talk. So right now, uh, Evan's been posting this uh, in the chat. Hopefully you all have login credentials and you're logged in to uh, something called uh, uh, a GameStop uh, class. So I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to start 
uh, I'm going to start this game. So what's going to happen, right, is when I start this game, and I'm actually going to go back in a minute and show you how this works, you're all going to be transported to a screen I'm about to show you, right? So right now, just to actually let me go back for one second uh, before I do this. Let me go back, uh, share screen. Sorry, I'm going to show you what the connections look like. Um, OK, so hopefully you're all seeing my screen again because I got ahead of myself. So here's the experiment. The experiment is you're all going to start with an amount of cash. And each round, you can buy or sell shares. And each round, a dividend payment is going to be announced. It's either going to be $1 or 40 cents. And at the end of the game, the person with the total amount of cash wins the game. This is, by the way, very important to Econ 50 students. There's a certain student named Morris who won, I think, every time we played this game. Um, I highly recommend Morris if you have a finance internship. He seems to have a real knack for this. So this is what the, ah, there we go, getting away from me. This is what the screen you're about to get dropped into looks like. The bottom, it'll show you two out of 15. That's the number of rounds you have left to trade. This is the amount of cash you have in the interest rate. The interest rate is zero, so you don't, if you uh, know what I mean by this, you don't need to worry about discounting. If you don't know what I mean by that, you don't need to worry because you don't need to do it. Um, this is how many shares you have. You can buy or sell shares. Um, these are the dividends. It will be $1 or 40 cents each round, then it'll be a coin toss. So if, the, if uh, it comes up uh, heads, say, you'll get a dollar. If it comes up tails, you'll get 40 cents on all the securities you own, okay? The security has no redemption value at the end. So at the end of 15 periods, it just simply ends, the game is over and you get sort of nothing. Okay, one more thing on terminology, right? Basically the terminology here is if you bid, that's an offer to buy at a specified price. If you are asking, you're offering to sell at a specified price. You could buy a share if you buy at the lowest price and I'll show you how to do that in a minute or if you have the highest bid and someone wants to sell. So if I have the highest bid and Evan wants to sell, I'm gonna get it. And you can sell if you say sell at the highest bid and or if you have the lowest ask and someone agrees to buy at this price. So it's a, it's a really simple market. Now, if that all sounds mysterious, don't worry. Um, you'll figure it out really, really quickly. The students do as well. There's a lot of randomness in the first period where the students are like, ah, at which point uh, it usually sort of goes pretty well. Okay. So this is the lever that tells you how to choose a price. You'll see that. And then you can uh, press buy or sell sort of at that price, depending. Um, or you can come over to this one and you can, you can sell at the highest bid, right? In this case, 775. Uh, or you can uh, go to the lowest ask and you can buy at that price, right? And that's how you do that. All right. One last, oh, these are the previous transactions in the round, and this is my last point, and then we're going to play. There are no margins. You cannot borrow money. You can only trade with money that you have. So uh, recognize this is not one of those where you're allowed to go uh, uh, to your broker uh, and uh, take on a lot uh, uh, of debt so that you can really sort of leverage up. All right. Is everyone ready? All right. Here we go. We're going to begin. All right. Are people logging in? Is it working? All I right, good. Up. Good. I, I saw Allison's thumb go up. This is good. And if you're oh good. And by the way, as you're as you're going in, new groups will form. Let me just share my screen. So right now, um, just to share this. This is what uh, I'm seeing. So right now there are 22 people in this game as some of you are sort of uh, uh, logging in and I'm gonna wait a little bit and you're playing in groups of 10. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's basically who's, uh, uh, who's involved with you. And no worries, you can log in at any time uh, uh, and, and it will simply uh, start a new round. So feel free to sort of drop in. see how this is going over here. Uh, yes, uh, we have a group that is uh, uh, buying and selling. Good. Okay. <clears throat> uh, others are, uh, let's see. Uh, 
good. Yes, the other problem, of course, with games is that uh, if you have not managed to log in, you are now uh, currently doing nothing other than watching uh, a, uh, a screen and my smiling face. Uh, so uh, ho hopefully you can get logged in. If you're having any trouble, um, uh, uh, feel free to use the chat function and we can try to, uh, we can try to get you uh, sort of in. Eric, I switch, I'm switching over to, um, to my screen. So maybe cool. you can walk me through really quickly what to do just uh got it uh here we go so uh so right now evan there are bids for thirty dollars and five dollars so uh and you have six shares so if you would like to uh if you would like to buy a share you could uh and you have fifty dollars in cash so so you have not done any trades yet nope. um, if you would like to uh you could sell um uh so you could you could sell one of your shares for thirty uh, if you wanted to, um, you could offer to, uh, let's see. So, yep. So you, uh, you have now, let's see. So did you do it? I don't know. Oh, so if you go to sell at the, uh, sell, uh, at the highest, uh, bid that would, uh, okay. Why is it not working? It should be working. So you, either one of those you can do, right? Um, so you could click the sell at the highest bid right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would sell it for $30. Um, uh, so you're offering to buy from someone at 520. And so far, no one is taking you up on that. Mm -hmm. Like a little higher, so go buy, buy at twenty four oh seven. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. So uh, let's see. I saw someone say can't get this to work. Um, is the problem logging in, or is the problem that it's not actually uh, letting you trade? I don't know. It says I'm logged in, but it's not letting me trade. But it's I can't. Not... So I, but I have to get out. Like I have to go out of Zoom. I can't see you if I go to Mob. I'm on a tablet. So is that uh, okay? So so you're um, so uh, so what what let's try to do is um, use the on the right where you see bid ask. Um, one way to see if this is working is um, simply try to see if there's any uh, uh, bid someone who's who's willing to buy your stock. So uh -huh. if you're if you're in a group, say like Evan is, um, which I know you can't see this, but right now the highest bid on Evans is thirty. Uh, and so if you click sell at this price, then you could, uh, you would sell one of your shares. Okay. Now, it went, so it seems to be working. I seem to have somehow bought a share because my cash went up to $74. So. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, this is good. So, so uh, um, actually I suspect you sold a share if your cash went up. Oh, you're right. I, th I think you, yeah, I think you actually, uh, I, I think you sure. decided to part with one of your shares. So you, your shares should be lower and your cash should be higher. So now okay. if you want to, buy a share uh and you could you could um just use the bid ask is it in your version is there any but is there any number in the bid or the ask there's a 281 in bid and i just put up a 30 for ask okay so uh see if anybody sort of takes you up on that um and that means i want to buy right uh yes you're you're basic uh you'll basically buy at the lowest ask so if you um so if you basically 27 so do i oh you could do that well, it's gone. Somebody beat you to it. Okay. This this is uh, this is of course why Wall Street insiders never actually have discussions like this in public because right now someone in your group is like, I got that. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, it looks like we've got about uh, looks like we've got about twenty seven people uh, sort of logged on. Is anybody else? Uh, you know what, Eric? I wonder if it's because the time expired that I can't do anything. Oh, interesting. Right now. It should be. Um, let me, I wonder why this is not working. Um, I'm guessing the students do it faster than what. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, it, what's interesting is uh, um, the, uh, yeah, we get a lot of, um, uh, we do a couple of practice rounds ahead of time um, because nicely we actually have multiple class periods. <laughs> so so we, uh, we tend to sort of do this. Let's see. So Evan, you're not able to uh, you're not able to buy or sell, right? I'm clicking everything. 
Okay. Let me. Uh, I'm checking. Hey, by the way, Evan, what number are you? 73. 73. 74. I'm 74. 74. Okay. Uh, weirdly, you're actually trading, Evan. I don't know why your screen's not, but um, you seem to be doing something. I wonder doing why. something good? Nope. Uh, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Are others uh, having trouble getting it to actually trade? Can't tell. <laughs> uh, Allison is just cleaning up, actually. We now know who's actually uh, uh, basically like soaking Evan for all he's sort of worth at this Alice point. Alice Eldridge? <laughs> I always liked her. <laughs> um, let's see. Refresh. Oh. oh, okay. I refresh. Thank you, Rebecca. Ah, this is good. So it looks like you could buy if you wanted to yeah. replace previous order you have orders outstanding uh <laughs> i like it. evan i'm beating you I, <laughs> this actually it turns out this is actually also a big part of this is um uh you know for the students is uh i own you uh gets yelled across lecture halls a lot it's a little <laughs> harder to do on zoom but yes i i think actually uh, operation own evan uh is uh you know so uh let's see Fuck. all right we have three groups started we have about uh let's see all right uh we're still going here i'm surprised let's see okay evan it looks like it's working mm -hmm. Evan might be the most public trader ever uh, on this one. This is. Uh... <laughs> oh, okay. That uh, that was it for sort of Evan. We've got a couple more people in. I think has everybody hit seen finish? No. No. Okay. A few people have seen finish, but not everyone. All right. Because uh, I think we have one group that or uh, two groups have finished, uh, one group has not. So I'll let this play out just a little bit longer. Um, now it's finished. All right. Okay, we are we are officially finished. All right. So uh, at this point, uh, welcome back. Um, so let me. I think what I'd like to do is I want to talk you through this, and then if we have time at the end, and you want to, we'll all see if we can uh, make money off Evan again. Uh, so that that would be my uh, that would be my sort of aim. So let me uh, let me actually um, uh, let me go back to sort of sharing my screen, and I want to talk you through why on earth we're doing this. So uh, you know you you might say, look, it's all well and good if you want to take money from Evan. That seems like fun, but uh, what what is the uh, uh, what is the purpose of this? And so let me share my screen again. Um, so hopefully you are now now looking at uh, what looks like uh, a, a very strange. Uh, oh, oh, I like this, Sherry. Sherry congratulations, 101. This is good. Um, I, I like this. Yet yeah, let's play this again while I can see this. All right. So let me just talk through this real quickly, and I'll sort of explain to you what's going on, and then I want to see if there's sort of a difference in the game. So. I don't know if anybody recognizes this chart, but if you do, um, this is GameStop. Um, now, hopefully. Um, uh, Hopefully, uh, uh, no one actually rode GameStop all the way to the top and on the bottom. But if you have, you don't even need to put it in the chart. But here's basically the question. The, the question, and this I had not talked about in Econ 50 because it hadn't happened yet, right? Um, here's the basic, uh, here's the basic uh, question is, um, what on earth is going on with GameStop? And by the way, I like this one. This came from The Economist. It didn't actually chart the fall uh, of GameStop. But what I like is that GameStop went up more than Bitcoin. So you know when you're sort of accelerating, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of even faster than uh, Bitcoin, something's going on. And so the question is, is this rational, 
right? So in, in Econ 50, we talk a lot about rationality. Just to give you a little of the background, uh, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not uh, following um, uh, 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 people's uh, strategies that are in the, the, um, the chat, here's the story. GameStop was a struggling uh, retailer of video games basically, right? Uh, it sold cartridges. And, and um, look, I'm, uh, I'm 52 years old, which means that I have no memory of GameStop, but my kids, this is where they would go when they would get money from their grandparents to buy like the latest Legends of Zelda cartridge, right? Uh, this was the place in the mall. The problem for GameStop is no one buys video games that way anymore, and the malls are all closed because of the pandemic. So this became a, a target for uh, shorts. And if you know what this is, a short uh, if you want to bet against a company, you go short by basically borrowing shares and selling them at the market price. And if the price goes down farther, you make money. And if it goes up, you lose money. In August, this guy, Ryan Cohen, who used to run an, uh, an online pet food store, started amassing a pretty large stake of, game, uh, uh, of GameStop. And he argued GameStop should invest in e-commerce. And this is where things get interesting from the point of view of Econ 50. What happened in January was that a Reddit board uh, called Wall Street Bets, began posting about the firm. And some of the posts were about this great strategy that uh, Cohen had for sort of revitalizing GameStop. But some of them were, we really need to beat the, the uh, Wall Street hedge funds. All of uh, us day traders should rally together and, and uh, destroy them. And off goes GameStop stock. So a lot of these posts on the Reddit forum were about basically sticking it to Wall Street. And in fact, it got, uh, the price got so high that Melvin Capital, which had been one of the big short uh, selling firms, had to basically accept a capital infusion of $2.7 billion. So just to give you an idea of how big this was, um, this was really a sort of a huge uh, increase in the stock that sort of no one was expecting. And so the question is, is this a bubble? Now here's the part in Econ 50 where uh, things get interesting because we do a section in Econ 50 about how would a, a stock be valued. And here's the thing. What you all know from playing this game, or at least those of you who made money, is a share should be kind of valued for the discounted present value of the dividends, right? So unless you just like holding pieces of paper with Apple on them, what you really care about is what the stock uh, is going to pay you in dividends. Now, you might say, well, maybe I care about the appreciation. But that just says, presumably, right, that uh, somebody else thinks it's going to have sort of higher dividends. So I talked to students about uh, trades can occur in that Econ 50 world, either because Evan and I have different expectations about how much the share is going to pay in dividends, or because we have different risk expectations. Evan's a very young man. He's got lots of time to sort of accumulate. I'm a little bit older. I might not want to hold as much risk. And so Evan and I might arrange trades that way. But what we won't do is, right, we, we wouldn't, you wouldn't expect us to be sort of trading uh, on a stock we had similar values for. And so the question is, can you explain GameStop that way? And that's the question I intend to pose to my students uh, uh, next fall when I teach Econ 50 again. And a guy we haven't met yet, but I'm sure you've all heard of, named John Maynard Keynes, said, well, there's a problem with this model. And Keynes said, look, here's what I'm worried about. I know Susan is rational, right? I know that Susan is completely rational, and she values stocks at the expected stream of dividends. But I'm actually not so sure about Rick. I think it's possible, actually, that Rick is irrational, and he might be subject to mob psychology. So maybe I want to pay just a little bit more for that stock, because he might pay even more for it in the future. And so Kane said, look, you, you, you might actually get uh, uh, bubbles. The problem is, in the world, it's really hard to tell the difference between disagreements about future values. Susan thinks that, that uh, GameStop's uh, new strategy is going to work. I don't. Versus us trading the stock because we actually think there's a good chance Rick's going to buy it and we think Rick is irrational, right? And so now the students are in a world that's a little more complex than kind of the basic Econ 50 world. Now, for those of you that, uh, like me, lived through the 90s, this should look really familiar. This is the NASDAQ uh, uh, going up and up and up, and this gets called the dot-com bubble. And if you remember, basically, there were like sock puppets telling us they were going to sell us dog food on the internet, and everything was going to be different, and the share values went up and up and up. The point that makes this interesting, though, is, and this is kind of the, the, the uh, point is, actually, I don't know about you, but the internet did change everything. How many Amazon boxes do you have in front of your house right now? 
right? And so there's this interesting thing that there was a story about tech firms back in the 90s, right? We sort of call this a bubble, but it's a little hard to sort out. So that takes us to the game we just played. Now, this is not one from what we just played, although there's a similar charts uh, that we could do uh, for sort of you guys. This is, this is one from uh, last fall. Now, I want to point out a couple things about this. Remember, I said the big insight Vernon Smith had was, how do we have the ceteris paribus assumption work out? And so here's the thing I want you to notice about this. The blue line is the expected value of this stock. Right? Because remember, every period a coin gets tossed and it's either worth a dollar or 40 cents. So, in expectation, every period over this game, that stock should be worth 70 cents each period. There's no discounting. So, over the whole length of that stock, it should be worth $10.20 over 15 periods. Right? And so, the blue line is what the stock is worth, and everybody can figure that out. Right? The second thing to note is right, that all the green dots are trades, and they're all above the line. So one thing you might think is maybe it's just hard to figure out expected value. I mean, these are, you know, freshmen in intro econ, uh, uh, you know, by the time we play this game, they've, you know, learned a lot of economics, but maybe they're just getting it wrong. But you'd think some would be high and low. They're always high. And then the other thing you'll notice is they converge by the 15th down to a much lower value. So it's clear the students know that this thing should go down like a step function, right? But they're always betting that it's going to be a little bit higher. And the other thing is the red line. Let's imagine, Jeff, I'm just going to, excuse me, I'm going to pick on you since you're also sitting uh, uh, on Zoom right left of me. But Jeff, let's imagine Jeff is just the world's most optimistic guy. He thinks every time he tosses a coin, it's going to come up heads and he's going to get a dollar. He should pick the red line, right? So even if Jeff thinks he's incredibly lucky, people still shouldn't be paying more than uh, uh, $15 for the stock in the first period and 14 in the second and so on. And we're still above that. So the idea behind this experiment is to get students thinking about, well, what's going on in this, right? What's sort of happening? And so it gets students thinking about a couple things. One is the, the role of markets, right? Which is markets kind of exist to sort of uh, deal with information uncertainty right? And to deal with people who have different valuations. But then the second thing is, what's the role of rationality, right? And what does it mean if I actually think that someone is uh, potentially going to sort of pay more, right? How does Allison make a whole bunch of money on this thing, right? She recognizes actually there are people paying way more than sort of the expected value of these shares, and she sort of trades on that information. And so we sort of talk a lot about this. Now, one quick thing, and then I'll, I'll take questions if anybody has them, uh, and then we'll go back and play another round. The question is, what does this actually tell us about GameStop? So this is a great tool for Econ 50. And, and the answer is, I've demonstrated that in a world where there's no uncertainty about the value of shares, we can still get a bubble, right? We can still get something, whoop, wrong way. We can still get something where the, the thing trades above the share price. And that's kind of interesting, particularly for students who've been talking a lot about rationality and the role of markets and so on. But you'll notice there's one issue here. And this is my could GameStop happen again. So here's the problem. Let's imagine that uh, what happens is uh, Jeff and I would like to actually uh, uh, talk up shares, right? And so what we're going to do is I hold share X, Jeff holds share Y. And I go on Reddit and I say, Paul, Paul, we have to stick it to the, the, the Wall Street traders. We've got to make them stop. We're, we're, going to, we're going to, we merry band of day traders, let's buy up stock X. And Jeff goes on Reddit, Wall Street Beats, and he says, I totally agree with, you know, sort of Helen at basement dot, you know, sort of whatever. He's right. We should stick it to the Wall Street. But you know what? The people who hold stock Y, they're really the ones we want to stick it to. Because remember, he's holding stock Y. And Cherry says, you know, actually, I don't think we should do that. We should do stock Z. And so the problem is we have a coordination problem that's not in this game, right? There's only one stock in this game. And so the question is, how do you sort of get coordination? Well, you know, there seems to need to be a story. Mortgage, you know, sort of housing prices never go down. Buy houses, they're always going to go up. Remember that one, right? Or uh, uh, tech is going to change everything by anything with the word .com in it. 
but there needs to be sort of some story. And so I guess the question is, can, uh, you know, are we in for sort of infinite bubbles now that, that sort of Reddit day traders uh, have discovered that they can sort of stick it to the shorts? And I think the answer is, I'm not sure because to use the logic, Jeff and I may be trying to get people to coordinate on different stocks. And if they didn't, you know, buy their childhood games there when they were sort of 12, are they necessarily all going to coordinate on the stocks that we want them to? And so I, I kind of leave you with that thought as kind of the limitation of this uh, as a uh, um, uh, as a as a uh, um, kind of a model for sort of how to think about markets. So I'm going to stop sharing there. Uh, I'm going to uh, before I take questions, I'm going to open up a uh, I'm going to open up a new game. So I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to say run game and I'm you should now all be dropped into a second game uh, and just while uh, people are sort of logging on uh, I'll take a couple questions and so uh, w one question said. Uh, uh, <laughs> like Rebecca's I am ready to make more money, I, I, I like this um, so one said uh, Allison asked did the reddit people uh, know the traders were shorting it. Yes, they seem to have, right? Melvin Capital seems to have actually been uh, kind of the target. They were actually aiming uh, for that. And I guess it had been sort of public on this. Um, so uh, um, uh, that, that I think is sort of one aspect of this. Uh, I like uh, uh, the comment in the chat that says, I should make my son pay his own tuition. Um, yeah, I, did I mention actually that we don't really pay them? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, there isn't actual money. They get bragging rights. Uh, so uh, no, there there is, by the way, a student investment fund, um, but uh, it actually has some very uh, tight strictures on it. It does trade quite a bit of money, uh, but they don't get to keep it. It sort of just gets put back in. So uh, there are sort of opportunities at CMC to uh, to stock trade, uh, and there is actually a, a little endowment uh, around the student investment fund, and a lot of students uh, go on to this uh, um, uh, and and sort of do this. But uh, in the end, they don't get to keep that either. Well, any other? Uh, uh, oh, Evan says uh, in the chat they actually manage about a million dollars. Um, uh, and and it's uh, it's quite competitive to get on. People, uh, are, uh, it's uh, it's one of the sort of favorite clubs, which I think is actually still running. Evan, do you know? I think it's still running. And uh... oh, Allison asked, can you tell us about yeah, shorting? Yes, it is. It, it, it is. Yes, I know it is. Okay, good. I I I, I had assumed uh, uh, this was something that could be done on Zoom, um, but I, I wasn't one hundred percent sure. Um, so so basically shorting. So this is where I get myself into trouble because of course I'm not a finance professor. But essentially, you can't short in this game. Shorting is essentially promising to deliver shares that someone buys from you now that you don't have. And so the idea would be if I'm shorting, uh, I say Jeff, you give me uh, five. Uh, dollars for a GameStop share now, and I'll give it to you uh, in a certain period of time in the future. And if it goes, the price goes down, I get to buy a share at a lower price and give it to Jeff. If the price goes up, though, Jeff gets a share for sort of uh, that might be, say, worth $10 that he only paid five for. Or in the case of GameStop, $400 that he only paid sort of uh, uh, $5 for. So you can see why the short squeeze was sort of so, so painful. Okay. Any other questions before we've got about 20 minutes uh, and it looks like I've got 27 people uh, sort of in anyone else want to. Um, yeah, this is actually uh, to Allison's point I got to take one more question. So Allison asked, uh, <laughs> um, why were they cheering when they were paying a lot for this right. So here's an interesting problem with rationality. So imagine and I, I give this example to the students. Imagine, Evan, I'm just going to keep picking on you. Sorry. Imagine what happens is we observe Evan every night going into his backyard with a stack of $100 bills and an expensive bottle of wine, pouring the bottle of wine onto the ground and lighting the $100 bills on fire. And one option might be to say, I think something's wrong with Evan. The other option is to say, no, Evan's just maximizing his utility. He likes pouring expensive wine in his backyard and burning $100 bills. And I think that's actually Allison's point, right, is like one option is, and this seems to be the media narrative, is just that there were a lot of, of Reddit users who were willing to burn a lot of money just to stick it to Melvin Capital, which is kind of the equivalent of Evan going into his backyard and, and pouring out uh, some expensive vintage uh, and, and sort of not drinking it. Um, and 
the other option is people were hoping that, uh, as Keynes kind of suggested, and our our model nicely kind of sorts that out because presumably none of you were sort of trading that stock kind of for the students weren't for sort of a higher premium out of sort of malice for the person that sort of bought it in the future because in the end it wasn't real money, right? Um, you do have to be a little careful when you run experiments. I, I remember when I was in college, I was a TA uh, and I had one, we did the supply and demand experiment and this one guy kept making these awful trades. And so you'd get the nice supply and demand curve, except this guy was always losing enormous amounts of money. And back before the internet, we were playing this in a big classroom, basically. People would walk up and hand us these. And finally, I'm like, I don't understand, buddy. Why do you keep selling this thing at a loss? And he looks at me and goes, I'm selling it to my girlfriend. Okay, makes perfect sense now. Like, you know, I totally get it. Go ahead, lose money. It's all fine. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I like the, uh, I have not met a single person who dished out thousands for a Peloton bike that says it wasn't worth it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you uh, uh, on this one, but at least that one, I understand what you're consuming. It's like a Tesla, right? It might not be the thing that I want to consume, but I totally understand sort of why you're consuming. That's difference of preferences. If you set fire to your Peloton bike, then I'm starting to wonder kind of why you, uh, why you sort of did this. So, all right, everybody ready? We'll we'll do uh, we'll do another question, one. Eric Rajiv asked if uh, does a very large sample confirm the chart that you showed about the optimistic bias? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so uh, there's a, a economist down the street uh, uh, at Caltech named Charlie Plot who plays this game, and he's played it with sort of a number of different groups uh, and very large uh, uh, groups of that. And what's interesting is he can generate these bubbles sort of with all sorts of groups uh, uh, in a laboratory setting. It's really interesting. Um, what I actually saw this when I was a graduate student, um, you know, probably 25 years ago, uh, and he came and presented this. And I remember thinking this can't be right. Um, and, and he kind of kept doing it. Um, and Plot's argument is basically that kind of within the internal logic of the experiment, the way you make money is actually hoping that someone is irrational. And he would play this with Caltech undergrads who certainly can calculate an expected value. In fact, they could probably do it when they were three, right? And, uh, and in effect, right, what he's saying is that actually the rational thing to do here, even in a large group, is to see if someone comes along uh, who's sort of overly optimistic which then reinforces your own uh, uh, sort of trading above kind of the expected value. So it's interesting because Plot has a slightly different theory than, than Keynes uh, being that they're sort of optimistic. Well, he says, you actually win this one by, by uh, potentially uh, being overly optimistic. And I do think that's where Plot's game and this example, and I tell this to the students, differs from kind of the, the normal stock markets, which is, you know, the other way you win in the stock market is you simply buy and hold it for a really long time and retire on it, right? And so in some sense, you know, if you're not trying to sort of, uh, uh, you know, make money off a quick trade, you know, if you have everything in sort of index funds or things you're sort of holding for long periods of time, or, you know, you're a, I don't know, small liberal arts college in Southern California uh, that would like to exist in 150 years, right? You, you don't, do rapid yeah. trades looking for people who are sort of mispricing assets. One last story and then I'll sort of kick the game on. Um, I had a good friend in graduate school whose uh, brother was actually one of the people involved in long-term capital management. Uh, and if you remember this, this was a, 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 a hedge fund that went bust uh, back in the uh, sort of early 90s over uh, sort of Russian debt. And it was designed to look for these small arbitrage opportunities. And what's interesting is this friend's brother said, you know, the, the, we, we had, after everything had sort of collapsed, we had dinner at one of the AEA meetings. And he said, the problem was we were, we were picking up quarters in front of bulldozers. He said, you know, the problem was you could make money on this, but you had to sort of have a really, uh, a lot of leverage. And the problem was if you got a big swing that you weren't expecting, you sort of got crushed by it. And I, that was an interesting statement was like, markets aren't perfect. There's still frictions there and you could sort of make money off them. But the way you do it, according to this guy, was to be so leveraged that uh, you were in a position where if, you know, Russian debt went the, sort of the other way, you had to get, you know, a bailout from the U.S. Treasury. So I, it was just an interesting conversation I kind of remember from graduate school that thinks on this. Um, okay. Yeah, I like, I like uh, 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 there's a statement on the chat that says, uh, time in the market beats timing the market every time. I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, another one that... Um, uh, 
yeah, uh, long-term capital management was the first, in fact, I think it was where too big to fail got coined, um, uh, was where it sort of came from. All right, since I am now at the limits of my stock knowledge, shall we go ahead and play another round? All right, we have, uh, we have about 10 or 12 minutes, but I'll stay on longer. Uh, feel free to, uh, uh, um, uh, feel free to uh, uh, drop out if you sort of need to, but, um, and I'll figure out which groups Evan's in so that we can all uh, uh, gang up on him. And thank you all, by the way, this was fun. And hopefully this is actually working for those of you that have stayed. Evan, is it, uh, is it, is it actually uh, playing? Rebecca, you ran out of cash? <laughs> Thank you. 
Does anybody want me to share my screen for those that are not? I would share my screen, Jeannie, but I actually don't really know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes you sharing your screen so much fun, Evan. That actually is, that is why I've enjoyed having you here. <laughs> Eric, can you see what we're doing? So I sort of can. What I can see is um, I can see what you've put in. So I, I can see, um, and then when it's all over, I can sort of produce a graph like the one I had in the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. So I can see, um, so for example, um, I can see uh, uh, on say group, uh, let's see, group four, um, who contains uh, person 48, uh, I, I can see that, that what sort of trades they're trying to execute at any given moment. But I can't actually see the history while it's going on. It doesn't update in real time. And what do you say, who, who wins? Is it the most cash or the most shares at the end? Most cash, most, uh, cash. most cash at the end, yeah. So most cash at the end uh, um, sort of wins. Uh, and usually because the students long on with their names, uh, we can actually do the big reveal at the end. Um, this one would be a little less exciting because it would be number 28, one, you know, uh, but uh, um, usually we have a big reveal. It was a little funny last semester because this one guy Morris just won every single time. Uh, it was kind of amazing. It got to be sort of a running joke that- In Morris did an A. I guess you can't uh, Morris did, did very, very well in the class. Uh, Morris was a very smart guy, but Morris also just uh, cleaned up in the stock market game. Uh, he was he was very good. All right, looks like we've got. If if uh, if people have five minutes, I'll show you some of the graphs from uh, uh, from this one, and we'll see if they worked as well as the uh, uh, ones. Uh, It, it's interesting because um, when you tell the students what's up, you actually uh, you do suddenly have a few that don't follow the, the bubble pattern uh, to um, someone's point, which is a, a few people you get groups where they're like, I'm just not, I'm not trading for sort of above uh, and uh, uh, almost almost always on the first round you do get something that looks like a bubble. All right, almost done. I also had forgotten that I set this to 10 rounds and not 15, which is what I usually do <laughs> Usually do in the class. I shortened this one for... Uh... <laughs> How'd you do, Evan? So I, en I ended with 14 shares and $71.20. So I kind of feel like I have more money and more shares. I, yeah. Good. The, the, the shares the shares end up not being worth anything, but, um, but that's good. $71 is not bad. But I feel like some people have a lot more dollars and a lot fewer shares. Uh, which is how you win, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, you know, I, I saw the strategy at the end. As soon as we talked about that, like round eight, everyone stopped buying and started only selling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Quite learning opportunity. And I would, I'm in that too. I'm like, well, I'm going to sell them for 10, eight, nine. Oh my God, I, I want to win. Stop <laughs> the price, stop the price. It, no, this is exactly it. All right, let, if people have time, let me, uh, uh, let me show you. I think we, everybody's finished, right? Okay, yeah. let, me sh let me show you. This is, um, let me see if I can do this. 
Um, all right. Does everybody see? Uh, uh, should look at. Uh, should look like my screen. Uh, so this is the first round results, right? So there's group one, uh, and uh, this one never kind of converges. They sort of stay high. Uh, here's here's group uh, two, and then here's the sort of the transactions, and we can go over here to the raw data, and we can see. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me see. I thought I could do who sort of won. Oh, scorecard. Here we go. Um, so uh, here is um, uh, whoever uh, CMC nine had the uh, in the first round uh, had the highest payoff. Whoever that was. Oh, very nice. 250. There's Jeff, well done. Debello, excellent. Um, nine. So let's look at the second one. Can you uh, make it bigger, Eric? I bigger? Let's see if I can. I bet I can. Uh, results. Let's see. How's that? Is that yeah, better? That's better? Okay. So this now looks like uh, it, it, this is this is group one. This kind of looks like you know it's now it's a little above the blue line, but you'll notice it's kind of going down. Uh, same thing for sort of group two. Uh, group three had a pretty good bubble going there. Uh, uh, group four, which I think was only one person, if I remember, I, I added robots this time because uh, we had sort of an odd number. So uh, whoever was in group four, uh, you were playing against robots. Um, and let's see if I can do this. Oh, whoop, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's see if I can. Uh, what I had a way of, let me close that. Uh, let's do scorecard. Here we go. Um, so this is uh, 40. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we know that was Jeff. Jeff, congratulations! You uh, uh, you won. This is the uh, the next highest is uh, forty eight. Someone got uh, seventeen. Uh... Kk. Oh hey. Kk Streeter. Mm -hmm. I was trying to uh, tell what number is. Yeah, I figured it out the second round. Buy sell high, buy low. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but that strategy, by the way, uh, you know. <laughs> um, and then fifty two. Uh, so, but this gives you kind of an idea, and, and this was usually what we'd sort of show. Rob Poy is 52, Rob Poy. Nicely done. Oh, um, and okay. then Jeff, we Jeff don't... and Rob, and I think even KK, all econ majors, if I, if I recall. KK, I'm not sure. All right, KK, now see. Jeff and Rob were all econ. No, I failed econ one at Brown University, I can promise you. <laughs> and barely passed it when I got my MBA. Not good at it. All right, so you know what? We're going to pretend you didn't say that because that ruins my general. Jeff, tell me you're an econ major. Jeff, Jeff is good. Jeff is not telling me he's an econ major. I was an ME. Okay. Yeah. Call that's, that's some solid. That works. We'll, 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 we'll claim you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like, uh, we will not reveal this person, but uh, $834. So, um, let's see, where were you, Evan? I'm 74. 74? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Somewhere at the bottom. Number five? I'm oh. 70, 74. Oh, you're number 74. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I always promised I wouldn't reveal the bottom. So um, <laughs> this, this is that there's usually a professor. Will you tell us who lost? No, <laughs> we, we won't. Well, that that we we just hit uh, the five o'clock hour and um, this was really fun so I appreciate all of you uh, doing this. Um, you've also allowed me to test run a lecture for next time so hopefully uh, GameStop will still be interesting uh, next fall when uh, a, a fresh new crop of Econ 50 students arrive uh, uh, to sort of take Econ 50. So, um, but I if, I'm happy to hang around if anybody has any additional questions or anything uh, like that. But otherwise, I'll turn it over to Evan. All right. Thanks so much, Professor Helen. Uh, Thank you so time. much. Thank yeah, you. It was amazing. That was awesome. And we've got lots of great programming coming up on Spring Family Connections, including that wine tasting that I mentioned. Do go online. Jeannie, throw that uh, URL back in the chat if you'd like. And as Professor Helen mentioned, feel free to, it's kind of an open forum. So either say hello and goodbye or ask a question. But thank you all. See you soon. Thanks.